Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at the Brookmead Congregational Church of the United Church of Christ. Well, I was like to put that of the, because it was over 50 years ago that Brookmead Congregational Church voted to join as the covenant affiliate of the United Church of Christ, which we're very proudly members of. And all of you who have joined Brookmead and wish to do so automatically become members of the United Church of Christ, the national body and all of the involvements that is the denomination we get into, which seem to be legion, which is wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me today, Steve. We're very fortunate today to have with us an old friend, excuse me, a long time friend. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that <pretty well. laughs> of, of Brookmead, uh, who came to Nashville actually to go to school. Your school of social work and also Vanderbilt Divinity, is that correct? Yes. Dorothy. Dorothy Gager has been a, an active co-conspirer, co-conspirator, friend of Brookmead for many years, and we are very pleased to have her with us today. And we are very pleased to have a wealth of folks who can fill in frequently here in the Nashville area. And, uh, Dorothy is one of our prizes. We're happy to snag you when we can, Dorothy. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to that. And would you join me, please, in the call to worship? We gather together to praise your name for the gift of life. We gather together to give thanks for the life and teachings of Jesus. We gather together to worship in this community of that day. And God's children stood in body or in spirit and sang. Thank you. 
with us today, a number of our newer folks who may be familiar to some of us, but not to others. Now is the time that we follow the old New England church tradition of passing peace. So if you will, uh, get up, you can bump elbows, you can pass the peace in any manner that you wish, and greet your friends, old and new, and book peace. two dozen folks, give or take a handful, who join with us on our Sunday services on the YouTube channel that we broadcast the Brookfield service from. We're very happy to have all of you with us, and I hope you were able to pass the peace between and among yourself if you're watching with someone else, or at least wave at the screen as uh, we come by. I have already introduced Dorothy Gager. Dorothy is ordained as a, an authorized minister in the United Church of Christ. She has served Brookfield off and on in constituting roles many times, if I'm not mistaken. And are you also active at Howard Congregational Church from time to time? From time to time. From time to time has been. Dorothy is a licensed social worker, as well as being a, an authorized minister in the UCC. We were very pleased to welcome her to our pulpit today. It is a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to wait and read the scripture a little bit later on, um, if I may deviate from the order of service a little bit. Um, when Beverly asked me if I could preach today, she reminded me that this is the Sunday when Thanksgiving is celebrated. Well, then I looked at the calendar and I realized that it is also the last Sunday of the liturgical year, which is celebrated as Christ the King Sunday. And it is Transgender Day of Remembrance. This is a sort of multi-purpose Sunday. I remember this Sunday service from when I was a student intern here. Dan Rosemark had crafted worship as a condensed trip through the liturgical year, starting with an Advent or Christmas hymn proceeding through Lent for the prayer of confession, leading to an Easter hymn, the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, the teachings of Jesus, and ending with acknowledgement as Christ is King. While most of the liturgical year is quite ancient, celebrating this Sunday as Christ the King Sunday is only originated in 1925. It was a response to the growing fascist movement of that time. Now, I am personally uncomfortable with the idea of the Christian religion superseding all of their expressions of faith, although this is a common understanding of the second coming of Christ. The thing that I love most about the United Church of Christ is the encouragement for individuals to think for themselves, and it's in that spirit that I share these thoughts with you. At the time when the New Testament was codified, there was limited knowledge of the religious traditions in other parts of the world. The enemy was Rome with its belief that the emperor was God. Those early Christians were looking for the second coming to overthrow the oppressive Roman domination and establish a world order with the risen Christ as its head. We live in a much more complicated world where we can't encounter people and beliefs from many different traditions many of them sharing common values with us. Let me share a story from my childhood. I grew up in Pilgrim Congregational Church in Chattanooga, and our pastor was good friends with the local reformed Jewish rabbi. One of them, I don't remember which one, explained their friendship this way. Good liberal theology is good liberal theology, whether it's Christian or Jewish. My mother arranged for Rabbi Feinstein to give the program for her book club. She wrote home from that program with a friend who said that she knew that Rabbi Feinstein was secretly a Christian because no one that wise could be going to hell. My usually mild-mannered mother entered the house ranting about what her friend had said. Currently in this country, there is a dangerous movement of white Christian nationalism that is a logical extension of the bigotry expressed by my mother's friend. 
It is couched in language of wanting to return to the way things used to be, characterized by censoring books in schools and libraries, dictating school curriculum, dehumanizing immigrants and asylum seekers, and seeking to legislate a certain understanding of morality. All of this is done in language that can sound innocuous until you realize that it's a kind of code that appeals to the fears of some white people. Some of the recent political ads were prime examples of this kind of not so veiled language. So yes, on this Christ the King Sunday, it is appropriate for individuals to recommit themselves to following Jesus, even using the language of knowing Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, if that is the way they understand him. Calling for Christ as we understand him to reign over all others can be more problematic. International Transgender Day of Remembrance was founded in 1999 to honor Rita, Hist Rita Hester, an African-American transgender woman who was murdered in Boston in November of the previous year. It's a day to remember our transgender brothers and sisters who have lost their lives because of prejudice and lack of understanding. <clears throat> we don't have to look very far to see examples of this prejudice and discrimination that they face. There are ongoing debates and attempts at legislation about bathrooms, athletics, and basic health care. The people who think parents should decide that their children's vaccination status denied parents the right to collaborate with medical professionals about the best plan of care for their transgender children. Just this week, the Tennessee Southern Baptist passed a resolution calling on parents, and I'm quoting here, <clears throat> to protect their children from sexual perversion, such as and not limited to LGBTQ+, homosexuality, lesbianism, same-sex marriage, drag queens, gender dysphoria, etc. end quote. This level of discrimination sets the stage for harassment and bullying, which often end in violence against transgender individuals. On this day, we remember the tragic loss of life that can result. This is a day to remember also the activities of the Southeast Conference of the United Church of Christ on behalf of transgender uh, individuals. Paul Agnes Tucker, who is a pastor of the church in Birmingham, was one of the named defendants in, I mean, named defendant, no, that's not the right, I don't know what the right word is. He was one of the people named in a suit to change some of the anti-transgender legislation that had been passed in Alabama. And the Southeast Conference recently adopted a resolution that we will present at General Synod when it is next held. I've asked Beverly to include links to those that information in the next Brookmead Beat. Well, now to Thanksgiving, the third aspect of this Sunday. Well, as I said, I grew up in Pilgrim Congregational Church, which in itself might make me see the origins of Thanksgiving kind of like a school play. On top of that, I'm a direct descendant of William Bradford. And if that weren't enough, the cornerstone of my home church is the millstone from the Congregational Brainerd Mission to the Cherokees, whose missionaries accompanied the Cherokees on Oklahoma in the Trail of Tears. Needless to say, I've grown up with a pretty rosy view of Thanksgiving and of my forebears' relationships with Native Americans. It was with considerable trepidation that I checked out a book about the real history of the Thanksgiving celebration. I fully expected to read about the pilgrims' imposition of Christianity upon the Native Americans with whom they came in contact, but that was not in play in those early years of the relationship, which was based on commerce. Contrary to what I had believed, those Native Americans had considerable prior relationships with the British, who had come to what we now call New England, prior to the Pilgrims' arrival in 1620. British trading ships began coming to the region in 1524. 
There were even some native individuals who had traveled to England and spoke good English. The settlement at, Pilgrim, at Plymouth was unique and that the Plym Pilgrims intended to stay rather than just coming for trading expeditions as previous Europeans had. It was the beginning of the process of colonization, which resulted in disputes over ownership of land with disastrous results for the natives. The tribe with whom the Pilgrims had the most contact was the Wampanoags, who were not ruled by a single chief, rather living in different villages, each one with its own leader. The pilgrims had actually looted graves and robbed from stored food when they first arrived. Rather than retaliating at the time, the Wampanoags watched their new neighbors from a distance, but did not have any real contact until the passing of the first winter, during which almost half of the pilgrims died. The head of one village, Massasoit, finally approached the pilgrims and a relationship of mutually beneficial trade developed. <clears throat> the pilgrims desperately needed food and they needed furs to send back to the, pay for the supplies that were being sent to them from England. Massasoit increased his power through having goods from the pilgrims to trade with members of other villages. That practice of trading was the foundation of the Wampanoag economic and social system. People did not accrue wealth for themselves by retaining items. Rather, they always planned to give them away as a way of building social ties and increasing their status. They carried this, under, this economic understanding into their dealings around land as well not understanding that their signature on a treaty meant that they were permanently giving up their use of the land. This fundamental difference in understanding commerce and especially the transfer of land accounted for much of the conflict that eventually occurred. The first gathering in 1621 was not an official time of Thanksgiving, which would have entailed fasting and prayer Instead, that first gathering was apparently a rather rowdy affair when the pilgrims were shooting off their muskets and playing games. When Massasoit and his followers heard the gunfire, they assumed that Plymouth was under attack and they went to their aid. They ended up staying for several days of feasting and celebration with them and actually outnumbered the pilgrims. Thanksgiving as a holiday began in 1637 when the Massachusetts Bay Colony celebrated the return of their soldiers who had just defeated the Pequot Indians in a bloody battle. Obviously, it was not the sort of gathering we have traditionally pictured. Since 1970, the fourth Thursday of November has been commemorated as a day of mourning by native people who gather at the statue of Massasoit and proceed to Plymouth Rock. As they say, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. This day of mourning is not just about the past, but about the present when native people are still fighting for their rights. So what do we do with all of this? We can look at the words of the Apostle Paul. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them and the God of peace will be with you. As I've pondered this passage, I realize that Christians always assume that they are indeed thinking of these noble values and putting into practice the teachings to which Paul referred. We humans have a terrible capacity to rationalize 
so that our prejudices and misconceptions are somehow in agreement with our beliefs. That includes the pilgrims as they deprive the Wampanoags of their land. That includes other settlers as they went to battle against Native Americans whom they saw as inferior. That includes my mother's sanctimonious friend and it includes white Christian nationalists. As I have read about institutional racism in this country, I can see where I have been socialized into such rationalization. And perhaps that's true for some of you as well. And I wonder how I still engage in behaviors and ideas that are oppressive to others. For me, Paul's admonition turns into a prayer. Dear God, may we rejoice in you always. May our gentleness be known to everyone. Remind us that you are near. May we not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let our requests be made known to you. And may your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Grant that we may think on whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent, and whatever is worthy of praise. May we put into action the things that we have learned and received and heard and noticed in the teachings of Jesus, so that your peace will be with us. Amen. Will you now stand as you are able and join me in hymn number 551 in the hymnal, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior.
Then let us join in the prayer of our Savior. You'll need to use your bulletin because this is a Native American wording translation of the Lord's Prayer. O great Spirit, our Father from above, we honor your name as sacred and holy. Bring your good road to us where the beauty of your ways in the spirit world is reflected in the earth below. Provide for us day by day the elk, the buffalo, and the salmon, the corn, the squash, and the wild rice. All the things we need for each day. Release us from the things we have done wrong. In the same way we release others for the things done wrong to us. Guide us away from the things that tempt us to stray from your good road and set us free from the evil one and his worthless ways. Aho, may it be so. And now let us join in the prayer for Transgender Day of Remembrance. <clears throat> God, full of mercy, Bless the souls of all who have lost their lives on this transgender day of remembrance. We call to mind today, young and old, of every race, faith, and gender experience who have died by violence. We remember those who have died because they would not hide, or did not pass, or did pass, or stood too proud. Today, we remember them, the reluctant activists, the fiery hurdle of appeals, the warrior for quiet truth, the one who no one really knew. As many as we can name, there are thousands more whom we cannot, and for whom no prayers may have been said. We mourn their senseless deaths and give thanks for their lives, for their teaching, and for the brief glow of each holy flame. We pray for the strength to carry on their legacy of vision, bravery, and love. And as we remember them, we remember with them the thousands more who have taken their own lives. We pray for resolve to root out the injustice, ignorance, and cruelty that grows despair. And we pray, God, that all those who perpetuate hate and violence will speedily come to understand that your creation has many faces, many genders, many holy expressions. Blessed are they who have allowed their divine image to shine in the world. Blessed is God in whom no light is extinguished. As Christians, we believe that everything that we have is on loan to us, and that we are held responsible for giving some of it back to the work of God on earth, because we're the ones who do that work on earth. I would invite you now, ushers, will you come forward, and we will take up the morning offering.
number 537 of the century control. Enjoy the holiday of Thanksgiving while remembering those who perhaps do not have as much for which to be thankful. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.